of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness.
couldn't stand to see my chains And so you came to be my rescue To part the waters in my way Jesus, you are my deliverance From death to life dark to light. Jesus, you show me what freedom is. And you call my name. And you broke my shame. And you are my
at that ancient cross How precious is my Savior's blood The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame The image of love upon death's frame Having my heart was worth the pain. What joy could you see beyond the grave? If love found my soul worth dying for, how wonderful, how glorious, my Savior's sky. Victorious, my chains are gone, my dead is paid, from death to life, from grace to grace. Oh, 
victorious. My chains are gone. My debt is paid. From death to life. From grace to grace. Yes, Lord God, we're so thankful for the freedom that we have in you, Lord that our chains are gone, Lord God, that our debts are paid because of the work that you did on the cross, Lord, that you have brought us from death to life, Lord. Lord, we celebrate that this morning, God, and we thank you for all you've done for us, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone out there said amen. Bridge family just want to give a shout out and say hi we miss you guys ever so much we're hanging out at the beach today and enjoying our time till school goes back what do you want to say uh, we hope you guys are having wonderful days and we hope to see you soon in person God bless you guys bye hi bridge family it's Tom and Katie here we're just at the beach we're taking a few days off and we saw sea lions and other animals. <laughs> yes, it's beautiful seeing God's nature. And um, we just uh, want to say we love you and we miss you. And we just want to remind all of us that God is with us. He has a purpose in all this. And we look forward to seeing all of you again really soon. Like tomorrow or <laughs> anyway. Yeah, tomorrow will be great. So we love you. Bye. <laughs> hey Bridge family, trying to squeeze us all in for a shout out. Say we miss you, we love you, and we can't wait to be together again. Bye! Hi Bridge family, Matt and Ray Shasky here saying how much we miss you and we love you. And we need to thank everyone for their prayer and support. During this past weekend we had a little issue and um, it was, it was um, humbling and overwhelming, uh, the support and the love that people have uh, for me and for Ray and the kids. And i just like to thank everybody for your support. Love you and I miss you. Um, I just want to say those prayers were felt. I know I've spoken to many of you and, um, and have shared that. But uh, when God's word says that uh, his peace which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds, um, I felt that. And so we just wanted to get on here real quick and just say thank you so much for all of your prayers. And we love you so much. And hope to see you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Bridge family. Pastor B here. I'm so excited that you've tuned in today. Uh, you may notice that I'm in a little bit of a different setting. Our Bridge studios were not available this weekend, but I am blessed to come to you from the comfort of my own front room. And today we're going to conclude our series that they may be one. In quick review, in week one, we asked and answered the question, why unity? And we discovered through Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, that our love for each other and our commitment to oneness, despite our differences, would tell the truth to the world about who Jesus is, who the Father and the Holy Spirit are, and our purpose as sons and daughters of God. We also acknowledge that the unity that God has called us to will be challenged by our disagreements on many levels. But it's okay that we disagree. We aren't robots and we are not required to uniformity. I know it's hard at times to grasp the reality that a, another Jesus follower may see aspects of life so completely different than you, but that's real. And it's real because we are all unique. We are complex 
And we have a myriad of stories and aspects of our background that we bring to the table that have shaped our perspective on things one way or another, even as believers who have decided upon Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But even in those moments, we can choose to love each other unconditionally, and we can choose to walk together. In week, week two, we looked at the how of unity. What are some keys, Pastor, that can help us to actually begin to pursue oneness and unity in the relationships that we have around us? And we talked about three important steps to that, that we would listen, first of all, listening for the purpose of understanding and not simply to reply, that we would learn, that we would not just be critics, but we would be students people who are really genuinely interested in who people are around us. And of course, lastly and most importantly, we would love that we would pray every day to ask God to give us a heart of love, His heart for people, for those who are especially different than we are. People are more important than their views. Amen? Well, last week we talked about the blessing of unity as we looked at Psalm 133. And in just review, I want to remind you that we discovered that unity is one good, meaning that it is good in the sight of God. It is what God actually requires of his people. Number two, it's pleasant. It's delightful. It's a blessing. It's satisfying to us. It's a sweet fragrance in the throne room of heaven. And it actually is a blessing to the world around us to see Different people, wired differently, look differently, different backgrounds, but walking in a common goal of glorifying God with everything that they do. Our unity is also sacred. And of course, David talks about in, that in Psalm 133, that it's like the precious oil or the anointing oil of the high priest. It's holy, it's anointed, and it's abundant, lavish, even messy. Sometimes our pursuit of unity is going to be messy and challenging, but it's so worth it, church family. And then, of course, we looked at unity as being refreshing. The psalmist goes on to say that it is like the dew of Mount Hermon at that 10,000 feet above sea level that brings the snow and the rain and the refreshing of that life-giving water down even to Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem, the place where ultimately Jesus came to reconcile us, though we are different from all over the world, that whosoever would believe upon him would be saved. And Jesus came to reconcile us to God there in Jerusalem. Amen? Well, today I want to conclude with a study of the fruit of unity. Again, I want to remind you that unity does not mean uniformity. It does not mean sameness. That unity really speaks to our purpose. And that purpose for the church has always been to bring the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And Jesus was clear in his prayer and in his teaching that our unity would be essential to our effectiveness in accomplishing that mission, that co-mission that we are on with the Lord. I want to read for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. You can also follow along today on our YouVersion Bible app. Verse 18, it says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Verse 20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this is our purpose, family, one that requires unity in order for us to be effective. We know that the enemy wants to divide the church knowing that a divided church will remain stalled in its mission. So throughout Scripture, we see that when we walk together, God does amazing things in us. I want to give you a couple of examples of the fruit of unity that we see in the New Testament. Let's talk for a minute about Acts chapter 2. And of course, it's such a familiar passage for us. 
that discusses how the disciples uh, receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know that at this point, the church, the early church that was just beginning, was scared to death for their lives. You see, Jesus had already uh, come and, and performed his life and ministry on the earth. He was crucified. He was risen again from the grave. And now the church was under tremendous persecution because there was this controversy around Christ's whereabouts. And so the church was under that scrutiny. And yet we see them in the Bible in one place and in one accord. Keeping in mind, listen, these were people just like you and me. They had disagreed before Jesus ascended to heaven, and they would disagree afterwards. However, the Bible says that not only were they in one place, how many know being in one place doesn't necessarily speak to unity, but they were in one accord. And more likely than not, we know from this passage that the early church was praying together. Isn't it amazing how praying together can bring people together? I think that's so interesting how the Holy Spirit does that, doesn't he? Have you ever tried to stay angry at someone that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about regarding forgiveness? If you're ever having a challenge breaking through that obstacle of unity, just start praying for the person that you're in disagreement with and see how the Lord will bring that fruit of unity. So in this particular passage, what was the fruit of their unity? Well, one, they were obedient all together to the command that Jesus had given them. And he said, stay in Jerusalem for the gift that the Father has promised. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, you will be endued with power to be my witnesses. So their obedience was unity. Their willingness to be in one place and in one heart, one accord was unity. And the fruit was they were all filled with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. What a blessing. Amen. I want, I want you to understand today that if adversity should have any positive effect, it should be that it unites us in prayer. Another illustration that we find of the fruit of unity in the, in the New Testament is just a few chapters later in Acts chapter 4. See, Peter and John were arrested uh, by the, the high priests and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, in Jerusalem at that time for healing a man. And they were arrested and then they were ultimately released. And when they were released, they gathered together with the early church. Acts chapter 4 verse 23 says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. Keep in mind, this is their prayer that they're praying all together. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Verse 29, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Look at verse 31. After they prayed, again, they were gathered together. Adversity brought them together in unity to seek the Lord in one accord with one voice. After they prayed this prayer, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were in one heart and mind. Look at what the Holy Spirit does to us when we commit ourselves to unity and invite the presence and the power of the Lord into our lives. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Now that's unity. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. The Bible says that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, amen, that God is in our midst. Church family, you know that it was the Lord's idea to make us a family, to make us the body of Christ and not a business or an organization. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. In verse 27, he says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. So Paul goes on to remind us that we are one body, but many parts. Kind of like an orchestra where we all play a different instrument, but we're playing the same song. And so unity brings us to a place of great appreciation for one another. And neither should we each individually underestimate our value to the whole. I think sometimes in our, in our church community, people can see the different roles that are expressed in the church and maybe see that others may have more value than the others. That's not at all the case. We all have the same value. We are all essential and necessary to what God wants to do through his church. But yes, we do have unique roles, ones that I believe that the Lord would call us to appreciate even more. Our worth in Jesus is the same despite the differences in our roles. And so we see that unity does something really marvelous in the church, is that as we work together, as we collaborate, as we put our hands together to a common goal, God does something way greater than the sum total of our parts. Kind of like that synergy idea, right? Where there's two or three people that do something and as the Lord blesses it because we're in the right heart, it's so much larger than any one of us could have done on our own. In closing, today I wanna to read for you from Philippians chapter two. And in this passage, we're going to get another phenomenal illustration of what it means to walk in unity in the relationships that we have in our lives. Verse 2, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Verse 5 in your relationships with one another, which is really what we've been talking about all month long, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This just goes so hand in hand with the prayer that Jesus prayed for us in John 17, that they may be one. I think the, the thing that is just so compelling to me about this passage of scripture is that Paul reminds us here that our unity in Christ requires humility. The greatest example that we will ever have of that is Christ Jesus. So Paul instructs us that in our relationships, the way that we engage in relationship in this life, which is really the most important thing that we do on this planet because it's all about people, that Jesus is our example in how we should live with one another. And I believe that we see four really important things in this passage that I want to quickly highlight for us. Number one, of course, we see humility. 
that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. What if we were to have that same mindset? What if in our pursuit of unity that we didn't see ourselves as better than other people and that we didn't use our position or our education or our background to our own advantage, but we would humble ourselves to be a blessing and endear ourselves to other people, just like Jesus did for us. Next, we see service. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself to become a servant. What a great example for what unity requires is that we would be willing to serve one another, to serve one another with our words, with our attitude, with our actions, to serve one another with our openness to understand and be a blessing to the people around us. Perhaps unity could even be achieved as we look for opportunities to be a blessing through service that we don't to people that we don't even know. Thirdly, we see obedience. Obedience is absolutely vital in order for us to achieve the oneness that God desires. We have to be obedient to the fact that this is something that God expects of us. We see that obedience in Jesus, that he was obedient, the Bible says, to death, even death on a cross. What if our commitment to unity called us to an obedience to die to ourselves? to be recognized as people who are willing to give their lives away. The Bible says there's no greater love than this, that a man would die and lay down his life for his friends. Now, that may not always be talking about an actual physical death. When I die to myself to prefer someone else, that is me being obedient to the example that Jesus set. Amen? And then lastly, we see sacrifice. He ultimately gave all that he had so that you and I could live in the abundant life and the freedom that we have today. I think that we're also going to see, as we just recognized in the last verses of that passage, that when we commit to unity through us, through that humility, that servanthood, that obedience, and that sacrifice, that the world will see Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords to the glory of the Father. So family, today in our message, as we look at the fruit of unity, we really have three examples for us. One, that we see that the fruit of unity is the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. The devil is scared to death when the body of Christ unites in one place and in one accord to seek the heart of the Father, because the Father is so willing to pour out his Spirit upon us in great measure. We also see that the fruit of unity is effective ministry through collaboration. That as we value one another as different members of one body, different instruments in one orchestra playing the same song, that we are far more effective than we could ever be on our own. And lastly, the fruit of unity is the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord to a world that is lost and dying around us. Dear friends, as I close this series, could I challenge us to unified prayer for our nation and for our world? And in just a few days, as we go into the polls to vote for this presidential election here in the United States, could I encourage us as we prepare that the most important part of our preparation would be prayer? that we would seek God and seek his heart. And I believe that the Lord is going to speak to you and he's going to lead you and, he, as he's, and he's going to guide you. In this season of great turmoil and unrest in our world, as we experience even disagreement, could we be committed to praying for those that we disagree with? Praying for those that would set themselves as an enemy against us, interceding for God's best, his blessing and his favor upon their lives. And listen, if you're like me, and you're listening to things on the radio and you're watching things on the television that, that you don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. Things that even challenge me and irritate me and want to cause me to become angry as I see them. Could we instead take a step back and pray and ask God to give us understanding and insight and peace and discernment and how we can live in the times that we're living in? Family, I love you so much. I'm so excited to see what God is doing, that we would be one as a community of believers here at The Bridge. So I want to encourage you to enjoy your time around Table Talk. And after Table Talk, please stick around for some important and exciting announcements. God bless you.
What's up, Rich family? We want to wrap up our day with a couple of announcements as we close. How good has this series been on unity? Four weeks that Pastor Brian has dug deep and, and really blessed us and encouraged us with something that I think is so poignant and relevant for the time we're living in. So, Pastor Brian, thank you for those words and for these past four weeks. If you missed any of the messages, just head to our YouTube channel. You can just search the Bridge Four Square Church if you're on YouTube, and you can find those messages there from the past month. They've been amazing. Just a couple of things to put on your radar. As always, this is a habit I have. I just check our website every morning. We got our weekly encouragement videos on Wednesdays. We have Zoom groups you can sign up for, outdoor connect groups for some in-person connection. Bridge Kids has been thriving during this time. They have over 30 weeks full of, of, of videos that they've been doing every week. Mr. Matt and Miss Alina have been doing an incredible job. So, as school has started back up, if you know any families with children that would love to be blessed on a Sunday morning by a really amazing, a funny, and interactive lesson by Mr. Matt and Miss Alina, they have worksheets, they have worship, they have another Bible lesson that they do. Just share that with that family. Share that with them. It's a way to bless them and evangelize and connect them with the bridge via the kiddos that are going to be watching those videos. So connect them there. Last thing, Pursuit Youth has kicked back up. Get more info on our website and on their Instagram. You can give it a follow if you are in middle school or high school. We love you and we miss you as always. We will see you next week.